Um, my name is Matt Kelly. Um, those of a few of you might have seen one of my talks either in at PGConf Silicon Valley or back um, a year ago at PGConf in NYC. Um, but I work at TripAdvisor. Um, we are actually a rather large Postgres shop, almost exclusively for being the backbone of our data center infrastructure. Um, and what I'm presenting about today is a piece of software we wrote last year um, that I got around to open sourcing um, that solved a very particular problem for us. This piece of software is very much an exercise in pragmatism. A lot of the things that this does for us, there are cool and interesting tools that people are building that are half built, put together, etc. But we want to find something that we could use immediately. So what was the problem that we were trying to solve? The problem we were trying to solve is actually a fairly common one, right? You need to do either user um, session storage for a website. For us, the particular use case we were solving was personalization, S things like also viewed or you know, hotel suggestions or things like that. Um, and these needed to keep track of your state on the site. Fairly simple use case, right? Um, but it's also incredibly high write volume. We're doing many thousands of writes per second, and a point read on every page view and most AJAX calls on the site. So it's just sitting there churning through and taking large volumes of data. Um, and you can't really keep up with this with a trigger-based replication solution by any stretch. Um, however, don't actually need to do complicated queries on this data. The data warehouse off in Hadoop land is going to handle um, the actual um, doing analytics, but we need to be able to serve something in the middle of a page request without slowing the page request down meaningfully. It's actually a valid use case for a NoSQL solution, except the NoSQL solution that we tried to get to stand up in our data center <coughs> related to some, or its name related to a, some sort of chair, um, we could not get it to um, stay up and function operationally in a way that we were comfortable with. So we, we turned to Postgres to um, get us out of this situation. So what we needed was essentially a distributed, multi-master, eventually consistent, upsert supporting, key value document store. And we were running 9.3 in our data centers, so we wanted to run 9.3. That, that point, 9.4 was a baby, barely released, and want to use existing tech. And we really only had about one engineer and two or three weeks worth of effort to put into this. So what could we do? Very much so. We ditched the magic and did the simple things. Shard management is all. You have to lay them out by hand, et cetera. But anyways, the first thing at the core of this is your standard PLPG SQL upsert. I, oops. I, this is not the actual implementation because concurrency, um, but it's PLPG SQL upsert with a twist. The twist is you check now when you're, the now of the row you're inserting and use that to decide whether or not you're going to actually complete the upsert or just drop the upsert on the floor. What this enables you to do is an upsert based replication that relies on timestamp in order to come to an eventually consistent state. We built the replication on top of this. So what, what did we concede when we were doing this replication? The concessions were a single key will always transition from a consistent state to a consistent state. A single key will eventually converge to the same value on every server. However, if key A is written and then key B is written, I can't guarantee to you that those will be replayed back in order. They'll be replayed at some point, but they won't be replayed back together in order. Um, and no, you can do joins and aggregates across keys, but you're going to get an inconsistent snapshot because of the whole bit of it playing stuff back out of order. Basic premise that we used is this. We had the servers linked together with a foreign data wrapper. And we used the upsert to capture 
blocks of time. We, we started with the min horizon so far. Um, and then every time through this loop, you go and say, from this peer, give me everything in this time window. I'm going to upsert it in order to merge with my existing data. Um, and then I'm just going to loop back around and do this repeatedly, and this becomes my database replication. Well, sort of, right? Um, can't do that completely in PLPG SQL because you need to enter and exit transactional contexts. Um, yes, you could do it with dynamic background workers, but this was 9.3 that I was deploying at the time, and you need dynamic background workers because you need one thread for every, um, for every replication um, link that you're forming. So we just stuck a simple um, Java daemon that sits side by side with Postgres and just pokes it and goes, run the replicate function, run the replicate function, run the replicate function, run the replicate function. But beyond that, all of the logic is basically just straight up in PLPG SQL. The other thing that's important about how this works is this entire strategy only works properly if all the transactions are properly settled before you try to deal with them. If there's a transaction in flight, you're going to have um, problems with um, doing these min and max horizons, similar to the problems that most um, trigger-based replications that aren't using um, the message queue run into. Um, the other thing, or, so in order to make sure the transactions were all completely settled, we um, leveraged basically what our expectations were. We're in the middle of serving a page request either back to Google or back to a user. I'm not going to go and allow a query to sit there and run for five seconds when I'm trying to serve um, a page when this is just ancillary data. Um, we set the statement timeout to a second even though our service actually bails out much earlier than that. Um, and what this allowed us to do is wait for, allow rep, have replication, wait at least the statement timeout, add a buffer. I just made it twice just because it was easy, right? But you add a buffer to make sure that basically all in-flight writes either have committed or have been, can't, or have been killed. Um, the contract here for doing these key value operations is that we're always running in auto commit mode. We're, you know, again, for the particular thing that, for doing like user session storage, this is perfectly fine. Um, and the other reason why this works is, at least for us and probably for a lot of people, um, users tend to be pinned to one data center or the other. They aren't popping around data centers really quickly. Um, because you would actually potentially have a problem for keys that get writes, um, writes to the same key within the, um, your buffer window there. Um, for those of, I kind of skimmed over real quickly what, why you have the unsettled transaction problem, but the basic idea is you begin the put call, replication for the win, you then run the replication function for the window, time window one, one through two, then you go the, do the commit, and then replication g runs again for the time window three through four, and you've completely um, missed the ability, you missed that first put call. So you really need the transactions all to have settled in order for this to work. Now, this approach has certain advantage, advantages. The replication itself is able to be done directly off of the main data tables. There's no queue table to be dealt with, and there's no wall processing. Wall processing is very cool. I've now signed up to do some of the reviewing of getting PG logical into core, but this is you know, something that's still in flight, whereas this just, there was nothing additional there. Um, you also get write compression for free. So if a user makes 10 writes in the course of a quick second, just because they, you know, refresh their page or jumped around, you only ever replicate the last state of that write, which ends up, um, de the replicas end up, if you, I just go and graph um, a number of inserts, updates, and inserts and updates, um, the replicas actually generally get 10 or 20% less writes, which just means you have to replicate less through. This write compression is 
also great for catching up from several hours of downtime. I can take a server down for five, six hours and have it catch up to replication in like 30 minutes. Um, largely because of, uh, well, A, because the replication works well, but also because a user session might be, go on for half an hour or an hour but, and have had 20 writes in it, but I'll only have to replicate the last one. So the further behind you are, the faster it replicates, um, which is the opposite of most trigger-based replications. Um, other fun thing there is there's no maximal downtime for replication catch-up. You're not sitting there watching your queue table grow or the wall grow because you don't have enough space. You can take it down for three weeks, take your backup that you took out three weeks ago, throw it in, and it will just catch up um, with replication. The other thing that we had to do um, was expiration. If I held on to user sessions permanently, you know, someone used the browser, they cleared their cookies, I'm never going to see that browser ever again. But, you know, I'm just going to have a monotonically increasing data set. Now, there were two ways we could approach this. We opted for the second one. The first one is you go and you throw in an expiration column, you keep an index on the expiration column, you, po you pop off the back of that index, and that's just how you do expiration, which is the simple and straightforward thing. The um, one downside of that approach is if you're holding on to data for three months and you know, two months in you decide, really I want to only hold on to this data for two months, now you have to do some really hokey things. So what we, we decided to do um, is actually store an expiration policy as an enum in each column, um, which basically specifies how valuable I see this piece of information. Um, and then there's a table that maps that value to a current expiration policy. And the process that goes through and does expiration goes, and every time it's going to do an expiration run, it goes and checks that mapping. So it's able to pretty quickly um, if we decide, oh, I actually want to hold on to this data for four months and I have the expiration at three months, let's just go change a config value and move on. Um, downside here is it does take a sequential scan to find what data to expire. Um, I just solved that with a little bit of rate limiting um, and there, it, does, it goes over the course of a couple hours. It comes through and cleans up all the shards. Um, this is just what I was talking about for how I was managing expiration policies, depending on them, and I keep one expiration policy, which is no expire, which I just want to keep my data forever. Um, this leads to an interesting aside. Um, expiration is actually really resource intensive in Postgres, no matter how you cut it. You always have to do, in order to do an expiration, you always have to either maintain an index to go find the data that you want to expire, do a sequential scan to go find that data, go run a delete, let the auto vacuumer come back through and clean that up, although probably you're going to get hint bits written or micro vacuums in the intermediate. So you actually pay a lot of I.O. in Postgres in a way that you don't in you know, something like Couchbase, which is optimized to do these sorts of things. Um, not saying this is actually something worth doing, but it's something worth thinking about of making um, expiration a little bit cheaper in Postgres. Again, refactoring that code would be a nightmare, but extending MVCC to be aware of expiry could be done if you had a timestamp column and you said, this column is now my expiration column, and you actually had the, for queries against that table, you had now aware of that column and check that as well for visibility and add some smarts to vacuum to clean that up. That would actually make doing expiration in Postgres as cheap as it is in some of these other systems. Other thing worth noting with this design was we needed to support deletes, obviously. Um, but because we're replicating directly off of the main data tables, you can't just go delete rows because the replicas won't be able to pick that up. So the way that we dealt with it was um, key deletes under the hood end up just being a set to null, 
We allow that to replicate through the system, and then the expiration daemon's job is to go, once the null has replicated everywhere, to go clean those rows up. Um, also, if you actually want to write null, you just have to write JSON null instead of SQL null. So changes the semantics, or pushes you to do a couple things, but it works. Um, from the client perspective, we actually made, from the client perspective, it doesn't have strong support for sharding. The client is required to know what data goes into what shard, very similar to the way most people use memcache. You go hash a key um, locally in your application, and then you pick where you're going to route that. Um, we, we use internally DNS to abstract over the physical location, so it just has a config shard one, shard two, shard three, et cetera. Um, this is the, that layer is the only part that we weren't able to open source here um, because it was pre-existing because we already had a sharding layer for that and very wedded into our application. Um, that being said, it's not that large of a piece of code and it's a pretty common thing that people write. Um, this also works perfectly fine with a single shard. You don't get some of the performance benefits that you have of running multiple shards, um, as well as um, you don't get multiple replication streams to kind of speed things up in that regard. Um, from the server perspective, it actually has a decent understanding of sharding. Um, when you go create your first catalog, you describe what you want to have happen, what shards you want to live on what hosts, um, and you then run the setup scripts. It goes, logs into all those databases, or logs into all those servers, creates appropriate databases, um, connects, and basically puts everything into place that's necessary to support those shards. And then the replication daemon actually is capable of starting up on a machine going and looking at what's on that machine, and um, it goes, looks at what's on that machine, and figures out what replication processes it needs to start up to connect all of the shards that are named the same inside of the um, cluster, essentially. Well, not cluster. Per, we use the term uh, on the side. The thing that pe most people think of as clusters. Um, but basically, it picks up and understands that and is able to set up, a, is able to set up and replicate shards um, pretty easily. Um, it is still worth sharding on a single host in this case um, for two reasons, uh, or probably three. Um, one, obviously, you can then start, if you need more than one box, you can split everything out. Um, it gives you more replication streams and it also decreases your lock contention. We found even not running replication just by having 12 shards on a single box, just by decreasing the lock contention, we were able to get through higher throughput. And seemings, we've already conceded all of our ability to do anything with the data other than make point queries. This is perfectly fine. Um, on a side, we really need a better term. Postgres uses cluster to mean something that no one, um, no one else uses cluster to mean. Um, BDR was proposing group for a while, although when I looked on their website, I couldn't find any, um, any more reference to that. Internally, when we were trying to build all of this and talk about it, we had a bunch of internal discussions, and we eventually settled on parade after hours of discussion. It's kind of, also, the shed was painted red. Um, According to some sur sources, it's a herd of elephants. Kind of funny, but anyways, it's a generic term that has no pre-existing software or engineering, software engineering or databases meaning. It's a reasonable choice. This is my current proposal. We, we need a better term. Um, high availability. In theory, we could have actually done something kind of cool and clever where we put, you know, we distributed the shards across machines and never you know, you lost one machine, you would have lost one duplicate copy of each shard, and you can imagine what that would look like. Also, it gets you into the realm of having to do quite a bit of configuration, and it becomes a bit of a night configuration nightmare, and you have to write a bunch of this code to do that distrib distribution, which can be done well, but this is exactly where some of our NoSQL solutions we're playing with and Elasticsearch 
tend to not be particularly good at it, and we didn't trust ourselves to do it well. Um, we end up doing the pr pragmatic solution. Postgres has perfectly functional physical streaming replication. You need a couple, you need a little more servers, but it works perfectly well. The pragmatic is, or the actual discovery is, we built all of this out with the intention of supporting, you know, three, four machine, um, three or four machines in each data center, and decided that we only needed one to keep up with the workload. Um, even a year later, and with a bunch of product teams, projects on top of it, we still the machine is it's burning 30% disk I/O at in the middle of the day, and like five or ten percent CPU, so the machine still has plenty of headroom to keep up with it. Um, replication monitoring is actually fairly simple. Um, the daemon goes and collects statistics um, into its primary catalog table, and basically this is the text of our Nagios check. Go see um, how far behind um, from the min horizon the replication lag is. We run that on one side, run it on the other, if replication were to die in any of the shards, we would, pretty, we would detect that pretty easily. It normally hangs out between, our buffer is two seconds. It normally hangs out between two to three and a half seconds behind. Um, so we can actually monitor that pretty aggressively. Uh, although we keep it a little bit far back just to network hiccups. That way we don't get paged on network hiccups. From a performance and reliability standpoint, this is actually something that is deployed into production. Um, like I said, I ha my oldest parade of this has been sitting around for about a year now. I deployed another one um, late last year, early spring, and I've got a hardware order out to deploy a third. Um, I've actually taken a decent amount of transactions. Um, freeze is the limiting factor in a lot. Freeze and outbound network bandwidth for doing physical streaming replication is the um, limiting factor. I'm doing freezes every 20 hours. This, I very much am looking forward to 9.6's aggressive vacuuming, replacing the full scan freezes. Um, other than hardware problems with the machines, um, I haven't had an operational incident with this since we've deployed it last year. We've had, you know, deployed new function. We've added new functionality and had to work on it, and you know, do normal maintenance. But it hasn't paged us, hasn't caused an operational incident or outage. And so, um, other thing that we decide to do, um, we get better performance by with this by running an async commit mode. It makes sense for this context because. It makes sense for this context because we were going to throw out writes anyways, um, because we're not going to block people's page views. So I lost an extra 100 milliseconds until I have completed a database failover or intervened. I'm going to lose seconds to minutes of data anyways. It doesn't really matter. Um, that being said, our normal, normally, I was just looking at some graphs in Grafana um, yesterday when I was finishing this off. We're taking about 2,000 writes per second and about 10,000 reads per second in our steady state during the day. Um, I've done load tests on this that push it closer to 15,000 writes per second and 45,000 reads per second. At this point, the streaming replica can't keep up on a 1 gigabit interface. We actually need a 10, we haven't done experiments with a 10 gigabit interface to see if the streaming replica can keep up. But needless to say, very high volumes. We also did. An interesting thing um, that was requested by the team that was doing personalization, they wanted to start doing K-Arm Bandit style machine learning on the site in real time as they have tests deployed to start prioritizing um, tags and certain things like that. Um, we've got a um, functionality in here that it does basically numeric patches on JSON documents. That way you can keep track of coefficients and things like that. It's a little bit clearer in the documentation. Um, but basically, it allows us to do, um, keep track of clicks and events on, you know, by, on a per location basis or things like that to start learning things um, and start while doing um, tests of code um, live. Um, really only works if you're mostly live in one data center, which we are. We spend, you know, probably um, 
20 minutes to an hour each year switching back and forth between data centers. We didn't want this to break, which is why we cared about multi-master. However, for something like this, we've just kind of conceded that it doesn't work very well while we're doing the data center switch. Um, where, does, where, does, where do I see this as belonging in the ecosystem? I think this is, it's immediately useful um, in that it, um, it works out of the box. It works on um, some on a stock version of Postgres. Um, set up scripts and permissions wouldn't um, allow it to work right on something like RDS, but with some minor modifications. It doesn't actually go and it doesn't get deeply integrated into the database. It's really just sitting on top of the database, so you could use it on those sorts of systems. Um, ultimately, I see this as being superseded by the newer features in core, although I think there's some lessons to be learned about how to handle these use cases. And although it's nicer to have um, the features in core, this does make some trade-offs, particularly around um, being able to replicate off the current state of the data table, which you can't do with wall logging or something like that. Um, potential improvements that I see, um, it needs a general cleanup and rewrite. Like I said, it was thrown together in two hours, or, two, or not two hours, a couple of weeks. It works, it's battle tested at this point, but code could use a little bit of cleanup. Um, needs to leverage newer Postgres features, I mean, a good portion of the actual code is just boilerplate around the fact that there's, there was an import foreign schema and insert on conflict, and there's no reason that there's a separate daemon on newer versions of Postgres, server-side shard routing. Um, and the other big one that I think is interesting is this strategy allows you to do online shard splits, where you actually build two new shards and then fail the um, client over to using the new shards while doing the replication. Um, it needs to be fleshed out a little bit more, but we just didn't implement it because we haven't needed it so far. Um, contributions, obviously, are welcome. Um, and that's all I had. Thank you. Our questions, and thank you. We, yes, we can move shards around. Um, the process for, we haven't had to do that yet, so I haven't, I ha only have the process in my head at this point. But it's basically go start up a new Postgres instance, add it, add half the shards on the machine to the replication topology, have it catch up on replication, be stable, move the clients over, and then just drop the shards and clean up the metadata properly. Um, we're using right now DNS in order to have them do that. Um, at this point, it's fairly manual because we have, we have a large control over our clients. We know particularly what the clients to this service are and we can tell them, I, I just updated the config, go reload your database connection config, um, which, which is why it's, like I said, it's not particularly magic, it's largely manual, but it, works for the straightforward use case. Would it be the same thing? Yes. They use, yeah, that wasn't particularly clear. He was asking, um, do they use a different host name for different key ranges? And yes, we have one host name for each shard in the data center, and we're able to reroute them based off of that. Uh, it's actually our general strategy in the data center is we don't actually have any of the clients ever point to a particular database or shard or anything like that. Everything's pointed back through C names and we control it from that choke point. Other questions? All right, seems like we're all set. Thank you guys very much. <laughs>